thank you for joining me. Um, every single one of you that's here, um, you personally, I'm glad that you're here and I'm glad that you're um, going to be able to get uh, the answers to your questions. So um, I had just begun saying when it comes to picking a good niche, it's really important to have a good framework for picking that niche. And so before we go into specific examples, which we're going to go through a ton of them here in this video, um, it's, it's important that we have sort of that framework. So, um, so uh, back to that. It's important for me when I'm starting a new niche website that I have some affinity for the topic. It has to fit me personally. Now, that doesn't always have to be the case. A lot of times, once you've been doing this for a while, it's really, um, it becomes easier and easier to just make websites on whatever topic. And we certainly do a fair amount of that. But on a website I'm gonna be working on personally, I'm gonna be so much more likely to succeed if I'm interested in the topic. The next is just, is there reasonable search volume? It's hard to know for sure, but if we just, if we just look at the topic as, as a whole, just how many people are into that? And, and that's important to consider as well. I'm also going to be talking about evergreen, how evergreen the content is. Um, typically I want to make sure that I'm focused on the topic, not just a product. We're going to look at competition, YMYL, authoritativeness, those kinds of things, and then how well we can monetize this website. And then beyond that, it's kind of nuanced. So let's dive into some specific examples. I got a whole bunch of them coming in here, um, here in the chat. And so we will, um, we will address those. I also, in my video earlier this week, uh, had several that were asked in the comments. And so I'm going to start with some of those real quick. So the first one was finance. Finance alone is just way too broad. Okay. We're going to have to pick some area of finance. When we look at a really broad topic, and that's going to be the case for some of these and some of these that you guys are submitting right now, um, is just, that's going to be way, 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 way too broad. Okay. So, um, we, we want to niche down. So when we look at finance, we need to think of the different ways we could break this down. We could break it down by just different aspects of finance. We could also break it down to different like subgroups of people who are searching about finance. And so one of the others that was submitted to me was personal finance for moms or for families. Now that's going to be um, a better niche because I'm going to be able to craft my content for a specific audience. Finance is an area that's really competitive. Um, a lot of people um, have written uh, finance blogs. And so uh, we, we're going to have a little bit harder time finding underserved topics. But sometimes we can talk about something that's already pretty well served, but talk about it with the nuance of the specific audience we're trying to target. And so what that does is it just opens that wide open. The other thing about finance is it is definitely YMYL, which is your money, your life. So um, uh, Google looks at those kinds of topics, um, topics about money, topics about uh, health, wellness, uh, well-being, those kinds of things, and wants to make sure that the content that they're ranking high has enough authority that it's likely to be accurate. Google doesn't know the answer to health and finance questions, but what they do, what they can do often is, um, is just look at a site and determine whether or not it is generally authoritative. Now, um, it, neither here nor there, uh, whether or not it's um, uh, right for Google to be determining what information is true or correct. Um, and, and it's not that they're censoring anybody, but it's more of, they don't want to, they don't want to promote content to the top of the search results that is likely to lead to somebody having a heart attack or, um, that's going to make somebody go bankrupt or do something illegal financially, those kinds of things. So that's why that's so important to them. The next, um, similar idea is similar in a lot of ways is travel. There are a lot of blogs about travel, but there are so many different aspects of travel that we can absolutely find cracks that are not um, that are not filled. So if we were to cover travel, like as a one topic sort of thing, there's just, it's just way too broad. We're never going to build up any authority anywhere, um, because we're going to be spread way too thin. So what we need to do is we need to pick some angle, some aspect of travel. Um, so one of the others that was submitted here was road travel, like road trips. Well, now we can talk about specific aspects of travel that we can build up authority in that space which is great, but also um, it allows us to kind of find these more specific cracks that somebody that was just covering travel in general, they would never write content on that specific of a topic. 
And so we, we just need to pick an angle. Another way to do travel is to do destination specific travel or destination type specific travel. For example, I could do a travel blog that's for people who like to do destination scuba diving. So it's kind of a mix between a scuba diving blog and a travel blog. It's going to be very focused. It's, I'm going to, I'm certainly going to be highlighting specific destinations um, and I'm going to have a specific angle to that. The question there is about search volume. Is there enough? And we're not going to know for sure, but there are a lot of people that scuba dive and there are a lot of people that travel to multiple places to scuba dive, in which case you're going to have people potentially coming back to your blog over and over and over again as they plan different trips. Um, all right, let's talk a little bit about, um, there's some of these that were submitted here that are more lifestyle. Now, not lifestyle necessarily in the sense of like, um, this is my lifestyle blog, follow me as a person, as opposed to my content. Um, these are more about just different aspects of lifestyle. So for example, uh, college life, college life as a topic. Now, um, for me, the biggest concern would be how is my level of interest going to be over time? So as I move past college, at some point, am I going to reach a point where I just don't want to write about college life anymore? Um, that's quite possible. Now, if that's not a concern for you or whatever, you're like, well, for the next five years, I'm good to go. I'll talk about college. Um, then I actually think it's a perfectly good niche. Uh, I think there's a lot of aspects to college life, even outside of just the educational element that we can blog about. There's certainly content on the web about that. There's content on the web about everything, but we can certainly find some cracks. We can talk about, um, you know, just living on your own for the first time and just kind of all the, you know, the hacks and the different things that you can do to set up a good life for yourself. Um, along those lines, somebody asked about a lifestyle blog talking about sort of different life pathways, careers, education, the different options available. Now, for this one, I would be concerned that if you tried to cover too many pathways from the very beginning. Um, and so what I would want to do is I'd want to kind of pick one angle first. So let's say I wanted to go down um, kind of a education slash career pathway. Um, so I would focus maybe first on something like uh, a specific area of like tech schools um, and sort of that pathway. So let's say I want to become, um, you know, a welder, pipe fitter, that kind of a thing. And so I might focus on that as sort of one angle first um, and maybe have two or three of those, um, but that they're relatively closely related. And that way we can make sure that we build up enough content on those specific topics that we actually have some authoritativeness there. Uh, if we just spread it super wide and just talk about life paths in general, then we're going to end up writing a lot of opinion content and that's not necessarily going to do very well for us. Um, for these, I mean, lead generation for schools is a great way to monetize. Certainly with ads, um, there will be some affiliate products and things along the way. I'm sure, uh, as we talk about some different, some different pathways, um, things that you would recommend that people should buy. Um, another one, um, different, but kind of along that lifestyle is vegan lifestyle. So this was submitted. Um, how, what do I think about that? Well, one, I think you're trudging kind of in the YMYL space because, because of the health aspect of it. Um, there are a lot of blogs. There's like super competition in the nutrition and fitness space. But by taking sort of the lifestyle angle and like living a vegan lifestyle and just kind of all the different things that come into play, if you focused more on that and a little bit less on just like the nutritional benefits and the health aspects of uh, vegan diet, I think you have a chance there. Um, I do think it's a little bit of an uphill battle simply because it's, it's a pretty competitive space. I also think that this type of content would probably do really well on uh, video, YouTube, potentially Instagram. Um, so if you're making a blog about this, I would potentially consider supplementing that with, um, an Instagram. And I, I know, uh, social media tends to be kind of a treadmill. We've, um, we've certainly steered people clear of a lot of social media in the past. But I do think that that type of content um, would spread really well on social media. Uh, digital nomad lifestyle. Um, I think this could do just fine. I think, uh, um, again, everything with lifestyle, we're going to always run into a fair amount of opinion content. And so the risk that you run is in 
um, crafting the content that you think people want or that you think people should have rather than doing proper search analysis and identifying topics that people are actually searching for. And that happens all the time um, in a lot of different niches. But I think in a lot of these lifestyle ones, uh, we're going to run into a lot of that. There's a whole bunch here coming in. Um, is astrophotography a good niche to write about? So astrophotography, I assume we're talking about like astronomy, like taking pictures of stars and things like that. Um, I think it could be depending upon how big the niche is topically. Uh, I think there are enough people that would be interested in it, not uh, many that would be interested in doing it and others that would be interested in um, just seeing the, the cool photography that people are doing. Um, and so between those two, sort of different angles, could we get enough search volume? I think so. But are we going to run out of things to write about? Um, I don't know enough about it to, to really know, but there's definitely affiliate products. Um, I got a good friend who takes some really cool pictures, uh, like through his telescope, um, of planets and things. And he's able to see some really cool stuff, um, just with like a normal, um, a normal telescope and the right kind of setup. And so there's definitely affiliate products. There's, there's stuff you could do. Could you put together um, an info product, a course on astrophotography, a, a beginner's course and maybe an intermediate level course? I think so. I would certainly pick something like astrophotography over photography in general. Um, all right, uh, Ralph, thank you. I appreciate that. There's a super chat here from Ralph. Um, just thinking, I, I really do appreciate that. I'm happy to be here and helping. Um, Personal management as for office and job workers. So this is kind of a mix of like time management, uh, maybe money management, um, work management, just making sure that you're living a, as good a life as you can in kind of a drab office environment. Um, I, I do think again that there's potential here. I guess the question I have is how many people are going to Google and searching for ways to be happier in their office job? And so you might, you might just go do a little bit of digging in Google trends, see what pops up, um, what kind of websites have this sort of content. Um, and are they succeeding? You might go look on YouTube and see, um, how many views videos on these topics are getting and just try to get an idea of whether or not there are enough people going to the internet for, um, for answers on just how to have a more productive and happier office lifestyle. Um, I would be a little bit worried, not that there aren't a lot of people with this issue, there are tons, but are they going to the internet for answers about it? Or are they just kind of living with it, assuming that that's just, it's maybe it's a them problem, I don't know. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good one to consider. Um, someone asked, what is Nate doing right now? Um, he's actually uh, going to pick up a, a vehicle. <laughs> right now, if that's the question. Um, okay. <laughs> um, okay. Is the keto diet a good niche? This one's coming here in the chat. Um, I would say no. Um, I know I've said it like on a lot of these, like, yes, it can be done. Keto diet's been around for a while and it's going to be around for a while, but I would be reluctant to tie myself to one specific diet or methodology. Um, things are, things change over time. Um, you know, Atkins was around for a long time, but now it's been replaced by better options, right? Um, there, basically I would want to pick something that was a little bit more long-term and that if you were to change, if you were to say, you know what, I've changed my mind. I, th I don't, I don't think keto is really the approach I, I would even take anymore. I would modify it with this and that. And so I, I would take more of a, of a nutrition based approach. Um, and then write a bunch of content about keto, but not make my whole website about that. Not pick a domain name that's just keto. Um, you might focus on diets that are more on the, the low carb side of things, um, but not, I don't think I'd stick to just keto. Also keep in mind, diet and nutrition and fitness is probably one of the most competitive spaces on the internet. Um, you're going to have the best success with this if you were to do a YouTube channel as opposed to a, a, a blog. I have one here. What do you think about a blog on ancient history, epics, uh, and civilizations? Um, I, I think it'd be, I think, I think it'd be good content. Um, but who are you going to get? Who's searching this kind of content? Are we getting high school and college students who are writing reports? Um, you know, beyond that, we'd really have to tap into the interest element of things. Again, I think here, 
we benefit more on a YouTube channel, at least today, okay? Um, I say at least today because as things move forward, um, some of the changes we're looking at seeing potentially with like the web 3.0 stuff, um, potentially we're gonna start seeing web content being able to be recommended more um, as opposed to just what are people specifically searching for. Today, YouTube is an amazing recommendation engine. It's a great place to get found even with mostly interest-based content. Um, with the web, with like written content today, we still need to keep in mind search. What are people actually specifically searching for? And if for the most part, I'm writing content that's only gonna be searched for by um, you know, high school and college students writing papers, uh, just the benefit of that, monetizing that uh, is, is a lot more difficult to do. Um, take another one here. Is the hammock camping niche too small? Now that I think is a great question um, because camping is obviously very broad. Um, so hammock camping, is that too small? Um, I don't think so because there's a lot of content you can write about camping in general that's still applicable to hammock, hammock camping. And so if you were to build a website focused on hammock camping, you could, you could still write content that's around hammock camping that's maybe not just specifically for hammock camping, um, but then kind of focus on the hammock camping approach for the most part. There's also a lot of information that you could share about hammock camping that is different and specific to hammock camping. Um, I see it as an amazing starting point. I would potentially wanna leave myself open to being able to uh, cover more uh, just additional peripheral topics in the future. Uh, so I might choose a domain name that's, I might not put hammock in the domain name, but I'm a little torn on that. You, you definitely could. In fact, you could have a domain name that's like hammockcamper.com, you know? And I don't think that precludes you from writing about other things uh, in the camping or hiking space. Um, it's just that you're the hammock camper, like that's who you are. And so um, I actually think that could work. Um, really well. I don't think it's too small. Uh, now, in terms of audience size, um, again, if we, if we allow ourselves to cover some of those peripheral topics, then all of a sudden there's topics in backpacking. Um, there's topics in just other camping in general that uh, we can write about where the search volume is probably very, very, very large. And so I don't have a problem with that, even though there may not be enough people just hammock camping to justify making that website. Okay, so I'm, I'm actually okay with that. All right, there's a couple people asking about this topic. Um, it was also pre-submitted to me. Actually, it's two topics. So first of all, just education. Education, again, is just way too broad. Uh, we need to figure out where, where within education we wanna be. Are we talking about um, you know, primary education, secondary education? Are we talking about vocational schools? Are we, are we covering the whole gamut? Are we talking about grad school too? I mean, where are we in this space? Are we gonna focus on a specific um, subset of people, but cover the, the entire gamut? Are we going to focus on a specific career field and then talk about the education requirements for that field? We've seen that do really, really well um, as, as sort of part of that. Um, and so that, that could work. Now, then the question comes up of alternative education. Somebody here asked about homeschool. Um, Homeschool specifically, I think works really well. There's a, there's a ton of content on the web about homeschool. I think there's probably still room for a lot more. Um, simply is it's just a really, really um, big topic with a lot of questions. People that are getting into homeschooling, there's so many questions they're gonna have over the first even few years of that. Um, and then if they have a second child and now they're having to homeschool two kids in diff at different levels of their learning, a whole bunch of new questions surface. So there's a ton to write about. Um, so there's plenty of room for that. I think by niching up just a little bit to just alternative education, um, that opens the door to some other opportunities. Now, if homeschool is your thing, I think I would, I would stick with homeschool. I think there's enough to write about in homeschool and there's plenty of search volume there. But if, if you just want to look at sort of alternative education opportunities, then it would, you would be able to cover some homeschool, you could cover some uh, information about private schools, different types of private schools. Um, you could cover information about charter schools. You could cover information about, um, again, I've mentioned a few times like vocational or kind of technical um, secondary, you know, education opportunities. Um, and, and 
you could you could ha essentially have a broader, more authoritative site in the long run. But I wouldn't want to cover all those at the same time. I'd kind of pick a couple, uh, start there, build up authority, and then and move from there. Um, okay, I'm going to take a couple more here from the chat. Uh, unmanned systems, drones, is that good? Um, I think even there, I would, I'd want to sort of, at least for starting, I'd want to pick sort of what's my angle. Am I doing drone photography or drones for photography? Uh, at videography, am I doing drones for, you know, movie making? Am I doing drones for um, kind of what's it, even just like private use for fun versus commercial use? Um, am I doing, am I talking about drones like that the military is using and just kind of informing the public about drones and the technology that's out there? Kind of what's sort of my angle? If we would just do drones in general, it's going to be really broad. So again, let's make sure that we at least start out by crafting content in just one or two of those spaces. That leaves us room to expand over, over time. But, um, but don't just kind of cover drones across the gamut, right? 100 articles spread out across all of drone technology, because I think it's gonna be hard to build up authority there. Um, I have another super chat here, Samuel asking, what do you think of trapping? Uh, it's underserved, but YouTube seems to demonetize channels like that like crazy. Um, yeah, YouTube's tough, and so is Google. Um, Jim and I talked not too long ago about Backfire, because he took the Backfire YouTube channel with him, and that's one of the things he's working on, as well as the website. And he's getting loads of traffic, he's getting loads of views on his videos, but the ad earnings are quite low compared to the other sites we've built. And, and it kind of makes sense. There are a lot of advertisers that are a bit iffy on having their advertisements show up on channels about guns, I think is even harder, but even hunting. And so trapping kind of falls into that hunting space um, where just there's a lot of people who just feel uneasy about it. Um, and so I, I do think it's a good niche. I think it's underserved. Um, and even like for Backfire, there's a lot of great ways to make money besides just ads from Google, you know, on, on your Google website, uh, your, you know, your blog. Um, so I say ads from Google it's because ad, uh, Google is the biggest ad network that all of the other ad um, companies that we use, all the brokers that we use, um, they, all, they all use Google for a significant portion of their ads. Um, but also YouTube, um, it's, it's not going to do as well with that monetization, but it could do really well with um, other types of monetization, but also the volume that we see. <laughs> getting, um, getting subscribers um, or even views on a website f uh, on these topics is easy uh, compared to some of the other niches that we've worked on that are easier to monetize. And so even though the monetization is lower, the overall earnings can be very good. So I think it's a good topic. I think it's dramatically underserved on the web. Um, so I think you're right there. Um, let's see. I've got more here, a bunch more. Um, we got one here from Mr. Pena's tu tutoring. Uh, six to eight math teacher, six to eighth grade, I assume. My audience includes mothers of students. I'm trying to use Kajabi and grow an audience on social media. Is this scattered? Um, it's not too scattered building a website and using growing an audience on social media it's not too scattered but it is really easy to um split your focus if you're trying to build up social media at the same time that you're crafting your initial blog content so typically what i'd recommend to somebody is make sure that your website has a bunch of blog content 50 even 100 blog posts in many cases um, before I really worry too much about building up my own social media following. Now that doesn't mean I can't go on social media and participate in existing, uh, you know, Facebook groups, um, Reddit, sub, you know, subreddits and forums and things and participate. And even just by using the name of your website as your, like your username, making it clear, like, this is where, this is who I'm representing. This is who I am. Um, you can gain some recognition and then, you know, on your profile, so if somebody clicks on that, they're like, wow, that answer was super helpful. Um, and they click on you, and then over on your profile, you're like, hey, this is who I am, this is my website, this is what I'm building. Um, you're going to start getting uh, traffic that way, you're gonna start getting some authority that way, and it's gonna be really helpful. So I think that's really beneficial. Building your own like Facebook group, building up your own Instagram um, following is something that I would probably hold off on until I have at least enough content on my website that if somebody came and looked at it, they'd be like, wow, this is a full-fledged website. They got a lot of good content here for me. 
Uh, Muhammad Abdul Wahid asks, he says, I'm from India, I already have a website about government jobs, updates and news. It's not getting much traffic. So news can be kind of tough. Um, they can get a lot of traffic, but you have to build yourself up as a reliable news source um, before you can really, before you're really gonna get a lot of traffic. Also, if you're in the news space, you're talking about that kind of stuff, you're going to wanna make sure that you're using um, schema markup to make it clear to the search engines that this is news content. And that way they're, they're gonna be able to, they're gonna show it with other news content. Um, you know, if I were to write local news um, as a blogger, I could get it to rank very well for somebody who here is local searching for that topic um, in kind of a news sort of format. It's just gonna pop up in their news. And so um, I think it can absolutely work really well. But um, the other thing about it is it's not at all evergreen. And monetization is almost gonna be entirely from ads or potentially um, like a sponsored ad where somebody's like, hey, you're a trusted news source now. I'd like to promote my product or promote my brand right there on your blog. And so then you kind of have a sponsored ad spot that, that pays more. But even that you can run through your ad provider so that it kind of gets captured in the same way. Um, Manor122, thank you. Um, thank you for that super chat. Let's see, we got a couple others that have come in here. What are some good sub niches for topics on money? How would you write about working from home? So uh, working from home, I think, is a great potential niche. Um, it does kind of fall into the money space, but it's not like direct finance. Like um, you're not necessarily talking about, you know, laws and, and ways to save on taxes and those sorts of things um, where kind of the legalities of it are, are potentially going to get in the way um, and, and where Google's going to uh, want to make sure you're authoritative before they uh, really show your content near the top of the search. Um, and so, uh, but how would I write about those kinds of topics? I would, I would definitely, I mean, you want to go through the search analysis methods. So we're going to go to Google and do some auto suggest, um, searching just, you know, around working from home. So here's, here's how I like to do this. So working from home as a phrase, you know, if I were to type that into Google and see kind of what Google auto suggests, it's, it's an, it's, worded in such a way that there aren't as many search phrases that are going to include those words working from home. Um, maybe like when working from home and then there's stuff before that, but it's harder to kind of get Google to, to give you those sorts of things. Um, you could use tools like answer the public keyword cheater. There's some others where you could type in those words and it'll give you a whole bunch of searches where that phrase is included. Um, but I would also just take some time to brainstorm a little bit like, what are the things people are thinking of when they're writing about working from home or when they're searching about working from home? What are some of the other words that are gonna be included? So like home office is gonna be a piece of that, um, but also like maybe there's some specific products, maybe there's some specific tools um, that they're looking for, software tools and things, um, or types rather, not even necessarily specific, um, you know, specific names of those. Then, um, do those in your Google auto suggest, put those in to answer the public and see what sort of questions are coming up. Uh, search queries are coming up, go, um, you know, as you check some of those, check the people also ask and see what Google is saying people are searching for. And next thing you know, you're fine. You're going to start going down these rabbit holes and you're going to find all these topics that people are searching for in, for answers about regarding working from home. There's going to be some that are going to be around, um, uh, productivity, uh, working from home when there's, uh, other people in the home, you got kids still at home and stuff during the day and, um, just so many other things. And so, um, anyway, I think, uh, you're just going to need to kind of go down those rab rabbit holes a little bit, and then you're going to come across all sorts of, uh, potential topics to write about. And that's true for basically all of these niches, but something where like working from home, I mean, that's kind of a long enough phrase that, um, using that just with like a Google auto suggest isn't, isn't going to give you great stuff. And so you, we need to brainstorm a little bit and, and find some of those other words that people are going to be using in their searches. Um, so manner 122 asks about gardening with individual plants as categories, um, either individual plants or potentially individual plant types. So you might have a category that's like tomatoes, but then within tomatoes, there's different types, right? Um, yeah, I think that's great. Uh, the other thing too is 
with gardening, there's a lot of stuff that is like um, location slash climate specific. And so um, you might you might sort of pick an area. I've noticed um, on YouTube a lot, and I think the same is true in blogging, um, a lot of times some, some of the really successful ones have, they, they have their area where they live and they focus on that. Um, and, and I think that works really well. Now the other blogging, the other blogs, the other websites that do really well in gardening are oftentimes like garden stores, places that sell um, plants and garden supplies and stuff online. Um, or that um, are just really authoritative sources of information. Their content isn't always that great, um, but it kind of gets the job done. Um, and since they have authority and there's not a lot of people writing on those specific plants or writing about those plants, um, then they're able to rank really, really well for that. I do think there's a lot of space here um, to write about, about these topics that are kind of underserved or where the answers are given by some authoritative source um, so a lot of other bloggers shy away from it, but um, just the answers just aren't as helpful as you would like to see. Um, Diana Wilson says, uh, Project 24 member, I appreciate everything you guys do. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. I, every single one of you that is here, um, really, really, um, it means a lot to me that you're here, uh, that you're participating in this, that you're supportive of me and of this channel. Um, so I appreciate uh, you for being here. Chris Puckett says, uh, what are some more ways to determine if a niche is too competitive? Um, yeah, you know, a lot of this kind of comes from experience over time. You, you kind of get a feel for it. You're like, okay, if I want to do anything in like the fitness space, losing weight, I just know, I mean, even five years ago, I could see there's so much content. It's hard um, to identify kind of a crack. Um, and when I say a crack, it's more like, a space um, within that niche, a topic, a, a, even a kind of a, a category of topics that I've broken into that there just isn't good information about. Um, it's harder to find those in some of those niches. Uh, and really what it comes down to is just doing those searches. And so, um, you know, what, what I might do is take a niche that I'm interested in and I might just start brainstorming. I might go to answer the public or keyword cheater or some of these and just see what are the questions people are asking. Now, if you only start with the high level, like let's say I'm going to do weightlifting and I type in weightlifting to answer the public and I get all the questions about weightlifting. Well, those are going to be competitive. That's just how it's going to be. But what if I were to do, to, to dive in a little bit deeper and just do like hit training? Um, or if I were to do, um, you know, bicep lifts, uh, um, or, you know, and I were to just kind of use my brain to break it down into smaller pieces and look for the questions people are asking about, you know, just how to get, how to get really big round biceps or how to make my arms look bigger. Um, <laughs> it's the kinds of things that guys think about, um, when they're into weightlifting, uh, how do I, you know, so many different questions around those types of things, and then go do those searches and see what sort of content shows up you may find that there are just some really well-known websites that you've heard of, um, even like legitimate magazines that have, um, you've got uh, medical websites, you've got just websites that you can, you can tell that the authority is there. And then there's a whole bunch of other bloggers and you're just like, man, I'm gonna get lost in the mix. It's not that you couldn't create a good enough piece of content to outrank them, but you're gonna get lost in the mix. And if you see that that's the case for like everything that you find, then it's going to be hard to find anywhere to break in. Because if we can break in to, because we found a crack, something that's underserved, then we can build authority in that space and we can build up enough authority that over time we can start ranking for those more and more and more competitive things. Um, it's just usually not going to happen on a brand new website. And so if we can't find those cracks, we just never break in. Okay. Uh, it's a great, great question. Uh, Evan Doyle thinks, um, scooter riding as an overall subject and then focusing on three categories, adult scooter riding, stunt scooter riding and dirt scooter riding. Um, yeah, I think that's awesome. Scooters are definitely a, a, a thing. Um, we've got, um, we, you know, we've got like the, the human powered <laughs> scooters. People do a lot of tricks and stunts on and stuff. And then now, um, obviously the scooters that are just out and about that you can rent, um, 
that's a, a really big common thing in a lot of a um, little bit more urban areas. Um, they're pretty awesome. And so I think you could cover so much information there and I think have a lot of, um, a lot of potential search queries. I think it's a good topic. Um, in terms of monetization, um, obviously there's some products, not a ton, um, involved with scooter riding. Um, you could do a lot with ads, potentially an info product, um, but it, it may rely a lot on ads unless you, uh, um, you know, unless you identify something that I just am not thinking of right off the bat. So monetization could potentially be uh, something you have to think about a little bit more in detail. Um, awesome. I'm scrolling through here to see there's just so many. Um, okay, here's one. Um, mechanical engineering education. Um, so, yeah, so I mentioned before um, that education for certain kind of career paths can potentially do really well. Um, I would either talk about just sort of mechanical engineering as a career and include education for that as one of the categories, or I would talk about just like education for engineering and talk about the different career paths you can go down and what education is required. I do think if it was just mechanical and engineering education, it might be a little too specific. That said, mechanical engineers can do so many different things in their career. They can go down so many different paths that in, in this instance, um, it might be big enough all on its own. Mechanical engineering is actually a pretty broad engineering field that opens you up to a lot of different opportunities. Um, so it might be enough. Um, it'd be worth a try, but I would probably pick a domain name that would allow me to branch out beyond just mechanical engineering if I determined that it was a little bit too specific in the future. Uh, Samuel um, asks, what about B2B niche niches like a blog on clinical trials targeting businesses? Highly technical and scientific might be harder to build authority. Um, yes, unless you are authoritative. If you've written white papers, you're published, you've got articles on Google Scholar, um, then, then I would potentially do this. But we, what we need to do is keep in mind, like, what is our intent? And that's really a big, um, a, a big consideration for all of these niches is like, what do I want from it? Um, if your goal is to support your business, with leads and to build up its authority and just this presence on the internet, um, then yes, absolutely. If the goal is to create a passive income on the side just from that content, then maybe no, because the search volume in a lot of B2B spaces is gonna be a little bit, it's gonna be quite a bit smaller, especially in something fairly specific. Um, the number of people searching for that kind of information is pretty small, but in a B2B space, the people that find it if they're gonna become a client or a customer of that business, the value of each and every one of them could potentially be huge. And so it kind of just depends on what the, what the goal and the outcome that you're searching for um, is, is likely to be. So um, there you go. Um, let's see. I missed a couple of super chats here. Um, exotic beverages. So I think that could do really well. We've see, I've seen successful websites that were just like, coffee and so exotic beverages that covers multiple because i think any one exotic beverage might be too specific to where not enough people are searching to they're just not searching for it but if you were to cover a bunch you know a bunch of them um then i think that that you could do just fine and it'd be pretty cool it's probably going to be more underserved or rather less served um than a lot of other niches that we could consider um so i think your competition level is going to be uh, quite a bit lower than what a lot of these are going to be. I think monetization could be good. I think you could create some good info products, um, a lot of how-to content, um, also just a lot of background content, um, uh, information about the different drinks, uh, nutritional value, just kind of why, you know, what types of drinks um, are out there and why people like them, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I, I think it's good. All right, I'm going to take a few more here that were also um, submitted previously. So kids literature. So this I think has kind of two problems. Literature is hard because monetization is tough. What are we going to do? Recommend books. Um, you know, you're going to be earning pennies for each one that's bought. Um, you can, you can earn money from ads, but if we're focusing on kids books, then, you know, we're, we're not, we're probably not targeting kids. We're probably targeting their parents. And if you keep that in mind, it could do just fine. Um, 
so we're writing we're writing articles for parents who are or getting books for their kids or, or choosing books or going to the library etc um i think it, it could do just fine i think you could do well um but again just just kind of keep that in mind that there aren't really a lot of other products um info products might be kind of tough unless you're talking about writing children's literature and then all of a sudden we open up the door for info info products courses and things um but uh, but if that's the thing that you love and you're passionate about then absolutely i don't i don't have enough of a concern about that one that i would say don't do it um and another one science experiments and activities for kids i know there are definitely some websites and youtube channels around like toys and games and things for kids but I, I think it's an awesome space to be in. The, the YouTube channels that talk about these kinds of things get tons of views. Just be careful that like if you were to do YouTube, that we're not targeting kids with the videos where it's, we want, we, we want the parents to watch the videos to do the activities with their kids. And, and the kids can watch the videos too, but that's not the target audience. If your target audience is clearly kids, then it's going, you're not going to be able to do well with, you know, monetization on YouTube and stuff. And also, um, I mean, the ad revenue is going to be super low, but also, um, kids don't, kids don't really buy stuff. Their parents do. So, um, anyway, so we definitely want to make sure that our target audience is clear. Um, a couple of these others like home theater, um, home theater is one that I think is a great niche. Um, it's a lot easier to show a lot of that stuff on YouTube. There's a lot of how-to content that um, does a lot better on YouTube. A lot of times, because if somebody does a Google search for how-to content, it used to be Google would show blog content, but now the top search results are often videos. So even if you're gonna blog about it, I would probably make supplement videos that go in the blog post as well for how-to content. Um, product reviews on, on these kinds of things, Again, we want to show, if you're gonna do a product review, you gotta get your hands on the product. Uh, we need to make quality content that's gonna beat all the content written by people who have never touched the product because that's what the majority of product review content out there is. But if you can do a good job of that, home theater is a great niche. Um, there's new stuff to write about all the time, but the technology doesn't change so quickly that your content becomes out of date um, really fast. Like if we were to do cell phone reviews. Uh, guitars. If we're going to talk about guitars just from a product standpoint, um, like, you know, uh, reviewing different guitars, um, it could be kind of cool if you were to take kind of a fun angle to it. If we're talking about guitar playing, then, um, or we're talking about guitar building, or, you know, uh, we're talking about guitar repair, then then I think then that the sorts of informational topics could do really, really well. I think if I were to do just, just like guitar like home guitar maintenance, uh, that would be way too small. I would either want to do like instrument maintenance, string instrument maintenance, um, and cleaning, etc., cetera, or, um, or I would want to branch out to like guitar playing, maintenance, care, all, et cetera, all of those things together. Um, I do think it could be really cool to have buyer's guide content for guitars, not necessarily product reviews, but helping me pick the right guitar. I recently started looking into, um, I want a new guitar. I'd like to be playing more, a new acoustic. Um, and I was like, I'm not exactly sure what to get. So I talked to a guy that I know at church who's like, he plays, he performs all the time. He's, he's awesome. And I was like, well, what do you like? And he's like, well, I'm a Taylor guy. I'm like, well, good. Cause I'm a Taylor guy too. I like Taylors. Um, not exclusively, but I do really like them. And I'm like, but there are a lot of models of Taylors. So where do I start? And I didn't even know anything about anything about the way that they, um, like the model numbers essentially tell you exactly what the guitar is. I didn't know that. And he explained it to me in an email. I'm like, well, that's a great blog post. Um, and then later I end up getting a magazine, um, from my brother, uh, from Taylor, um, that also explains it all super well, but like, that's not content that's super easy to just find. So if I'm a beginner guitar player, I want to know like, how do I pick the right guitar? Do I just go to a pawn shop and buy a guitar? Or is there, is there something else I should be looking into? And um, even for somebody who's played um, guitar for a while, I think unless you're really like on that scene and around a bunch of other guitar players and have seen and played on a bunch of guitars, uh, you're just not really gonna know. And so I think that could be great content as well. Another one here, uh, self-improvement, personal development, mindset. Um, 
I think that's a tough niche to break into. Most of the content is really opinion based. And for the most part, nobody cares what your opinion is unless you have proof to show it. So if you've done something really successful in your life and, and people know you for that thing, then doing something on like self improvement, personal development makes a lot of sense. Um, and if you think about it, most of the people that we look at and look up to in those spaces, they started somewhere and they did something awesome. Um, and they're known for that. And so that's why we look to them for that kind of information. Another one here about, um, another question I got was a, a niche site about knives. Um, we, we've done it, we've seen it, it works. Uh, it was a good topic a few years ago. I think it still is, um, especially because knives and if you expand it just to blades in general is such a huge topic. There's so many different things to talk about. There's everyday carry knives. There's um, just regular camping pocket knives. There's multi-tools. There's, um, and then there's all of these other different specialized knives and blades um, that people use for different things. We, we could talk about kitchen knives. I think you could do a website. I don't know that I would do a website entirely on like cooking and chef and kitchen knives, um, but I feel like you almost could. <laughs> like it's, it's a little too small, but um, I guess my point being here that knives is a, is a big enough topic. That said, it's very product focused. And so um, if I were to do a website on knife building, I think, um, I think that would be really cool. Um, it'd be a really great topic. If I were to do a website on um, just about just some topic that uses knives, right? I could do a website on everyday carry. I could do a website on camping. I could do a website on cooking. Um, and then knives would be a piece of that. And so I think that's kind of the thing is um, it's very product centric. And so unless you're getting your hands on a lot of knives and just doing some really awesome reviews, um, you know, in today's world, it's going to be a little bit harder to get the traffic. So it's, it's worked really well in the past. I think it still could if you did it right. But, um, but yeah, we'd want to make sure that we treat knives as a topic somehow and not just as a product to write about. Um, question here about non YMYL niches that are best avoided for beginners. Um, some examples and heuristics. Um, yeah, some examples here, non YMYL, but, but still really competitive niches. There are a handful of those. Interestingly enough, some of the most competitive niches are YMYL. Like, um, like I said, I've mentioned fitness, which is a little bit less YMYL. Um, it's health related, but most of the queries that people are searching aren't like life and death kind of queries. And so it's, there's more of a lifestyle element to fitness, um, even some nutrition content, but it's still extremely competitive. Um, likewise, anything that's strongly opinion based. So that's kind of a heuristic there, but, um, I've mentioned a couple times things around like self-development, um, you know, self-improvement, that kind of stuff, unless you have something really like that people know you for that you've been really successful with. You're really known for, you know, um, if you're somebody who lost 200 pounds and kept it off for like the next five years and people know you for that, like that happened and it was public, um, you know, then having content about self-improvement from a health and fitness standpoint, yeah, it's going to do really well because people have a reason to look up to you. Um, I think about, there are numerous, um, podcasters and YouTubers that kind of fall into different categories. Um, Jocko Willink is one. He is a retired Navy SEAL. Okay. Like his work as a Navy SEAL and then writing a book about leadership. And then he was interviewed on the Joe Rogan podcast people came to know him through those things as someone who knew a lot about leadership, who had experience leading teams of Navy SEALs. Well, that puts him in a fairly unique position compared to a lot of the rest of us. And so when he starts a podcast, um, he immediately gets a big following, even though he's talking about stuff where there's most of what he says is based upon his opinion and his experience. Um, but it does really, really well because his opinion and experience, have authority because of that experience that he's had. Um, some other niches here, uh, anything that's really kind of hobby focused often does really well for us. So, um, somebody asked about quilting is quilting good or should they niche down to a specific type of quilting? If I were to do a website about quilting, 
I would probably start with content that's a little bit more niched down, but I wouldn't necessarily niche down the website. Like I wouldn't pick a domain name that was like just really specific, um, just on this one aspect of quilting. Um, but, but again, I would probably um, start by writing content in just a couple of those categories that are more niched down and write enough content in those categories that you build up a little bit of authority on the subtopics and then grow the content from there, um, branch out. And over time, you can eventually, you may end up only covering some aspects of quilting, but you also may end up branching out and just kind of covering quilting overall because you were able to build up enough authority as a quilter, as someone who teaches quilting, that, um, that it, doesn't, it didn't matter, um, that, you kind of co that you start to spread out. So that's something we can feel out over time as we see how our content does. How about educational topics in grade eight to 12, physics and chemistry? Um, so again, kind of my issue here is who's the target audience? If the target audience is eight to 12th grade students who are looking for homework health, uh, homework help, then that's not an audience that is really, really valuable from an ads standpoint because they don't buy a lot of stuff. And so I'm not gonna make as much money from ads. I'm gonna get a lower EPMV or RPM or depending on uh, your ad provider, what, how they measure that. Um, I'm not gonna be able to really sell them a lot of products, info products, things like that. I might be able to, um, you know, I might be able to capture leads for like science camps. I don't know. I, it, it becomes a little bit more difficult because that's just an audience that's not super valuable. However, it also depends on what your objective is. If your objective is to get kids more interested in these topics, then um, you know we can craft content that's for parents as well as for teenage uh, kids that based on things they're currently searching for, but that steers them toward some of this really cool stuff. So like, you know, if I make YouTube videos, like I think about people like Mark Rober, right? He makes YouTube videos that are just really cool and really fun to watch, but he pulls in that science element that gets kids interested in engineering, um, the physics and some of that kind of stuff. And so then from there, now he's been able to create sort of his summer camp, um, like a digital and um, online summer camp where kids can sign up and they can learn how to do some of that stuff for themselves. Um, and it's super cool. And so if that's more of kind of a mission driven thing um, and you can target the right audience so that it's not just the kids, then I think it could do really, really, really awesome. So it kind of depends on what you want to do. Now doing that with just a blog can be kind of tough because kids aren't usually super excited to read blogs. They're a lot more excited to watch YouTube videos. Um, but I do think that there's still a lot of potential for that kind of content. Um, I just saw, oh, self-improvement as a psychiatrist or psychologist. Now there we're, we're talking about something a little bit different, right? We're talking about self-improvement from a more medical angle. And if you're the psychologist or the psychiatrist and have, you have that to lean back on. So as long as on our website, we're able to highlight, you know, that credential that you have, the experience that you have, um, you know, you'd want to make sure that you did that. You'd probably also want to go get interviewed on podcasts and just be involved in your industry in a public way so that it's easy for the search engines to, um, to see that authority that you have, then I think it's got some good potential. Um, but again, then the self-improvement, you would probably take the more um, psychological based approach to that and not just an opinion based approach because, hey, I'm somebody who's successful. You should want to self-improve and become like me, which is what a lot of them end up being. Um, one here, uh, so many here, competitive cheerleading. Um, already getting 20,000 page views a month, but having trouble deciding on subtopics and categories. Uh, any suggestions for this or even sports in general, just other sports. So, um, you know, with competitive cheerleading, one thing is you've, you've focused on competitive cheerleading, but can we branch that out beyond just the competitive cheerleading and talk about other cheerleading topics that aren't necessarily only applicable to competitive cheer? Um, then that allows us to talk about um, maybe some of the, you know, when should I, when, you know, how young can kids start learning cheerleading? Um, what are the, you know, what should I be looking for in a school for, uh, or, you know, in a studio or whatever that teaches, you know, you know, should I be taking tumbling classes? Should I be doing dance? Should I, be, you know, where should I start a kid um, that that's interested in doing cheerleading? Um, 
other subcategories could just be like, uh, you know, cheerleading like at your school, but then, you know, joining cheerleading topics around cheerleading teams that are through other organizations, um, cheerleading opportunities beyond high school, beyond college, um, you know, careers for people who were cheerleaders, like what, like there are kind of different directions that we could go, um, depending on kind of what your interests are. But I think there's a lot of content around different topics that you could do. Um, another one here, what about boxing? I think boxing would be a great one. Um, you might do, you could do boxing. It's a big enough sport and it's been around forever. Uh, it's not going anywhere. Um, and so I'm not worried about it not being evergreen enough, but, um, but you could also branch out to like striking, um, sports competitions. Uh, and so I think that's, uh, that, that's one way you could go if you wanted to, uh, you could do MMA, but I actually think boxing alone is big enough. Then the question is, are we talking about like boxing the professional sport and just like, you know, following that sport and helping, you know, or are we talking about boxing as, you know, a life, a lifestyle sport, something that people are doing, even if they're not doing it in a competitive environment, they're, they're, they're boxing, they're going and they're, they're boxing, but you know, maybe they're doing some tournaments and stuff, but it's not like just professional boxing, the sport. It's kind of like, you know, a blog about basketball, the sport for kids, basketball, the sport for adults who want to still play, but they're not in high school anymore. Um, and so like league kind of opportunities. And then there's basketball, like, Hey, we're following professional sports teams. And so those are pretty different topics. And so you'd probably want to sort of pick a direction and go with that. Uh, same thing. Um, Steve Knight, asked about Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Um, same idea. It's a, it's a, it's a sport that, um, it's not going anywhere. It's been around for, for quite a while now, not nearly as long as boxing, but, um, it's, it's one that's really picking up steam and expanding, um, to a lot of places. Um, actually it's one I'm involved in myself. Um, but anyway, uh, I think it's a great topic. There's tons to write about. There are certainly existing blogs about the topic, but, um, tons of information, uh, to share just about the sport, um, getting involved in it. Uh, I mentioned it to my kids and my son's just like tons of questions that come up for him that are the same kinds of questions that my wife would have before um, being interested in, um, starting kids in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu or really any kind of martial arts. Um, Pratik Sharma says, I started a blog last month, hence a beginner in artificial intelligence. Uh, 500 views over the month. What are some of the strategies to increase views? So um, really we talk about a lot of that stuff here on this channel, increasing views. A lot of it comes down to search analysis, picking the right topics and then creating the best resource you can. Um, and really a better resource than what's already out there for that search query. So we want to identify good search queries um, that, you know, so we find out what people are actually searching. Um, and we have plenty of videos that, that talk about different ways to do that. Um, and then we just want to actually do that search and see what sort of other content is out there. Our goal is never to copy the content other people have. It's rather to look at it and just determine, is this question, is this query sufficiently answered? And really, if I could provide a resource that would provide just better information to people, um, then I should, and I will. And that, that resource eventually should outrank the other content that's out there, uh, especially as we do this more and more and more, and you end up building up authority for your site. Um, Brenda asks about activities for the elderly. Um, sure. I, I mean, it kind of also, I would, it would, it would depend a little bit on how specific you want to be, right? Are we talking about like nursing home elderly? Or are we talking about like retired people, you know, people over 65, which, you know, today is not in a lot of cases, not really that elderly. Um, but I, I do think that either way, um, there's, there's a ton of stuff to talk about now. Um, focusing on the activities I think would be good because there are a lot of times that you could easily slip into kind of, um, health related stuff. Um, and, and you'd want to be a little bit cautious about that just because of the YMYL stuff. But I think it's a great, it's a great niche. Um, let's see here. We got another one here. How about sub niches of tourism? Um, absolutely. So, Within tourism, I mean, you there's kind of different types of tourism, and then there's different like destinations for tourism, and they are a little bit related. So when I say that, I'm like, what I mean is when my wife and I go on trips, we um, 
we often end up going to museums and um, of all different kinds. We, we end up going to historical sites. We're kind of the, the nerdy people that just want to learn about the area, learn about the culture, learn about where it came from. Um, but then there's tourism that's like doing all the fun stuff, seeing the cool sites, but like, um, you know, like, oh, I want to see that castle. That's awesome. But I'm not here to get a history lesson. Um, but also, but I, you know, I'm here. I also want to go scuba diving or I want to go uh, cave diving or I want to go, um, you know, do zip line tours and stuff. So there's kind of different, different um, ways to go with that. So those are different enough that I might kind of focus on one or the other, um, at least first. I don't know. But you also might pick a region of the world because tourism in a lot of Europe is going to be pretty different from tourism in the Caribbean um, or tourism even in like the uh, New England area of the United States uh, versus tourism like national park tourism. You could do a whole website just on national parks um, and visiting national parks. So um, Nancy, one of these days I will be, I will have to come to San Diego and um, I will definitely check out Balboa Park. Um, 17 museums, that's awesome. Um, thanks Nancy, that's a great recommendation. Uh, how about the bidet niche? You think it would be profitable? It's funny because that was one of Jim's like um, ideas from last year. Um, I think it could be, but again, this comes back to it's very product focused. I don't know how many topics around bidets I would write about, but I think you could make a website with maybe 40 articles total that just is kind of the ultimate like helping me pick the right bidet. Um, and, and I don't know. You probably could come up with some topics around bidets as well. Um, and maintaining them and cleaning them or whatever. But um, but I, uh, I do think it could work. I think it could work just fine. Uh, but again, you would want to, as Jim recommended in that video a year ago, um, you'd want to buy all the bidets and test them and show that you're test, you tested them, um, take photos with, of them. Um, and that way you would have a really authoritative reviews um, compared to many sites who, again, are just relying on what other people wrote on Amazon. Um, wow, I had a bunch of others that were submitted here. Let me, there's a couple here. Um, James, I saw that you asked this question as well, and I'm going to get to that one in just a second. A couple others that are asked a lot. Um, dogs or pets. Uh, dogs, there are so many websites about dogs as well as cats, uh, many breed specific websites about them. Um, do I think that makes it too saturated? Not necessarily. Um, but you're going to want to make sure you can identify at least some cracks before you dive in on just dogs or cats. Um, that said, pets is a really broad niche. We, dis we did that once. We built a website from scratch that covered just tons of different pets and it has been effective. It worked really well. It gets tons of traffic today. We don't own it anymore, but it's still doing quite well. Um, it can be done, but we wrote a ton of content to be successful with that. And, and we don't dive into a ton of breed specific or um, uh, animals. We do have some breed specific content, but, but, what it never, um, but what it never really covers is like, if I were to adopt a German Shepherd, then you know, what are all the different things that I would need to know? Whereas somebody with a website about German Shepherds, they could cover that in a ton of detail. Now there are multiple websites about German Shepherds and others about um, Labradors and others, I mean, uh, t tons of different uh, breeds of dogs. So um, just look at the competition and, I, and for the specific area you want to go into. And I do think there's plenty of room for success there still with a lot of different pets, but dogs and cats in particular, there's a ton of content. So just go do a bunch of those searches. And um, like I mentioned earlier, go do some of that search analysis and identify just a ton of questions that people search on the web and go do those searches and try to see if you can find just a couple of areas that are underserved. If you can, then that's a great starting point and I wouldn't hesitate to dive in. Okay, so James asked his question earlier about um, uh, if, you, if I had these two options, skydiving or woodworking, which would I pick? Um, there's, my answer would be woodworking for a couple of reasons. Um, one is because a higher level of interest for me personally. Um, and so that's, a, that's the personal subjective uh, opinion piece of it. But here's the other thing. With skydiving, um, 
uh, if I'm thinking about monetization, how am I going to monetize that? Advertising, maybe lead generation for skydiving places um, or an affiliate program for different skydiving places, but that's really location specific. Um, you know, are there some online classes for um, to learn some of the basics of skydiving before you go? Maybe, maybe I can get an affiliate link there. But you know, it, it's something that a smaller percentage of the population does, and the ones that do it, most of them do it once or twice. And then there's a handful of people that get really into it, but most of them aren't necessarily like using their own gear all the time. There's not, there's not a lot for me to do there. Um, whereas with woodworking, there are so many tools, there's so many different directions to go within woodworking. Um, you know, we can talk about like um, kind of carpentry, cabinet making, we can talk about, um, you know, kind of uh, wood carving and small stuff that's really like um, precision based. We can, t I mean, there's, there's a lot of different angles we can go with woodworking that it's kind of a never ending topic. You can find cracks, they're gonna be out there. And so if it were me, um, I would pick woodworking um, over skydiving for sure. And then Trisha says, raising a toy breed dog in regards to feeding, dressing, taking them with you, rescuing versus buying, all the fun stuff and hard stuff that goes along with it. Um, yeah, I think, and this is where I, I say, like when we get into specific breeds of uh, dogs or, or cats, um, there are a lot of different topics, um, a lot of different potential search queries that we could write for that even though they're pretty competitive um, or rather even though there's a lot of other websites that talk about those specific types of dogs um, you know having a second opinion or a second approach to doing stuff uh, is fine and so even if there's an, another blog or two or three that answer that question if it's not like just super crowded there's not you know two pages of search results from google that are all articles right on point there's going to be room. We're going to be able to write stuff. And, and some of our articles are going to do better than others. But over time, we can build up that authority and start outranking other sites um, if we're if we're going to stick with it. So um, I do think it's still a good niche. Um, I recommended it to people. I think it's um, I do think it's it's it is getting harder to do. But I think a big part of that is because a lot of people who write in that niche jump into it. And um, initially they start writing content about the things they want to write content about. It's like, oh, well, how about this really cool outfit for my dog? I'm gonna go talk about that. And they go write an article about it. And they didn't actually do search analysis to identify whether or not anybody was searching for anything related to that. They didn't answer a specific search query. And so I think that's a huge mistake a lot of people make, really in any niche, but it's definitely happening in um, these pet niches as well. And then Natalie says, I do massage therapy and movement tips for pain management and rehab. Thoughts, I'm struggling. Um, yeah, again, um, where it is, it's a health topic. There is uh, a certain aspect of YMYL. Um, and so, so because of that, Google's just going to want to make sure that you're authoritative. Um, search analysis is, I think, going to be really the key here. What we need to do is make sure that we're finding topics that people are actually typing into the search bar and write articles that really like if we go do that search what's the content that's ranking um and uh, and can we write something that's better and if we do that and just repeatedly time and time and time again then um over time several of those articles are going to find they're going to get found they're going to get picked up they're going to rank well and as they do it's going to boost the rest of the site i'm seeing this right now on sites we're building but also on um on a site that I'm looking at for, um, for someone else where, you know, he's, he's, he's kind of worried. He's like, I'm not getting a ton of traffic for the number of articles I've written yet. And I'm like, it's still early days, but look, you have some articles that are starting to win and watch what's happening is the traffic across the site is starting to be lifted by that. Um, because once we start getting some that really win, we have some authority now and the other articles start to get boosted in the rankings. And then your content starts to get indexed faster by Google. And, and next thing you know, um, you can write an article, it's ranking within a week, and uh, it's ranking on page one <laughs> within a week, and you're getting traffic from new content. Um, so I think that's a big piece of it too, is depending kind of how long you've been working on this, um, it might seem like it's not working. And it's really just, it's working, it's just we need to 
kind of follow the process and trust the system. Um, and then one here from InfoNerd. Any niches that are least based on affiliate sales? I'm not entirely sure what we're asking here, but like what niches are there out there that are not based on affiliate sales? Um, and there are tons of these. There are a lot of these that we've talked about today that are not, um, they're not even that great for affiliate, but I think they're still good niches. Um, you know, uh, we give some, like alternative education, right? There's, there's definitely some affiliate products out there. There's definitely some homeschooling systems we could recommend, but um, there's a lot of alternative education that's not even about homeschool that there aren't products for. It's mostly information, but could we create an info product for somebody? Um, and can we create content that gets enough traffic to where just earning money from ads is worth it? Uh, Camper Report, when we had it, before we sold it, was earning about $10,000 a month just from ads. We'd we had affiliate on the site and it used to drive a ton of, of income for us, but as we created more content, we didn't do a great job of adding affiliate links and, and optimizing them, um, but we just placed ads on the site and they did really well and the ad revenue grew over time um, cause the, actually the EPMV grew over time. So even as the traffic sort of leveled and plateaued, the income continued to grow until it reached a kind of a level where it plateaued and it was earning over $30 per thousand page views on the website just from paid ads. And so, um, and there are a lot of niches that, that we've talked about today that kind of fall into that where affiliate sales are, are really a very small piece, if a piece at all. All right, um, I've gone over the time that I planned to, um, but I just, it's hard for me to stop. And there's still so many of these coming in um, that I don't really want to stop, but I need to. Um, so thank you for joining me today. I really appreciate you being here and, and participating in this with me and sharing your ideas um, and allowing me to give you some feedback and at least uh, uh, at least giving me a chance <laughs> to, to say what I think about it. What I think about it is by no means gonna be a definitive, it's gonna work or it's not gonna work. A lot of this is gonna come down to the, the effort that you put into it. Um, can, can you do the search analysis? Can you write, can you craft the content that's gonna succeed? Um, and so there's, there's really a lot that goes into choosing, into building a successful website, but picking the right niche for you is, is like the first key. If we can get a good niche that you're going to be interested in that actually has potential to get traffic and that has potential to be well monetized, then after that, it's, it's just a matter of working through it, crafting the right content. And over time, eventually you're going to figure it out. So stick with it. You got this and we'll see you all next time. Thanks for joining me again.